Hi guys, Ray from Whimsical Pictures here, continuing where we last left off with my manga shelf tour. Uh, in the last video, I went through shelves three and four of my standard or nearly standard sized manga volumes, and today we will be going through shelves five and six. Uh, from here on out, it is all Japanese manga until we get to my oversized bookshelf. Um, yesterday I showed you volumes 1 through 5 of this series here, Kazeto Kino Uta by Keiko Takemiya, one of the members of the Year 24 group, and today I am showing you the rest of that series, which is volumes 6 through 17. Uh, this series is collect- wow, complete. This series is complete at 17 volumes, and these editions that I have are all pretty early. Uh, the earliest volume one that I have is uh, 1977, so it's not like they're first editions or anything, but I do, for these classic series, like trying to find, you know, someone selling them used online from, you know, the copies that they read when they were teenagers or kids. Um, so that's what these are, and they're not the prettiest books. You can see the spines are in very good shape, and the latter half of the series looks barely touched at all, but uh, a couple of the earlier ones are very yellow, so you can see there. Uh, but they are from the 1970s, so <laughs> that's, you know, 50 years ago now. <laughs> I don't expect them to be in perfect condition. Uh, this series is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, it is one of the earliest BL series uh, ever written, Boys Love. It's about the sort of budding romance between two boys, uh, Gilbert and Serge. You can see them on the cover here. At a boys boarding school in France. And it's more or less the story of Serge coming of age and growing up, realizing his attraction to boys uh, through his relationship with Gilbert, as well as the story of Gilbert trying desperately to move beyond this really traumatic backstory that he has. Um, Gilbert, his life is just an absolute mess. Um, this series is going to have a lot of content warnings um, around things like child grooming and child sexual assault, um, coercive relationships, uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll put a full list in the description below, but it really, despite the cute art style, is not for the faint of heart. Um, this is also, it's not, like, particularly explicit by today's standards, they don't show a whole lot, but it is a whole lot more explicit than, like, say, the heart of Thomas. It's it's definitely the slutty twin brother, I think. <laughs> uh, it was also the first ma shoujo manga to feature a love scene, and uh, also the first shoujo manga to feature a love scene between two boys, um, with the sort of consummation of this relationship between Gilbert and Serge. Um, Gilbert is honestly one of the best manga characters that I've come across. He is famous and well-remembered for a reason. He's very complicated and fascinating, and you just, you want to root for him even when you're just shaking your head in frustration, uh, because he just keeps digging the same ruts for himself over and over again. Um, and also the artwork, of course, is Keiko Takemiya. It's stunning. I love the way that she conveys movement with these kinds of sequential drawings. Um, 
some of her layouts are also just like insane. Like, look at this. It's gorgeous. I just said on Twitter, but like, her layouts make me feel like I'm dreaming. And that's. Ugh. I just love Year 24 and 70s shoujo manga so much. Ugh. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> it definitely, I think, falls into that sort of, like, tragic gay story that, like, is a little dated at this point, but I think it's well worth the read anyway. I think it's incredible. Next, we have the complete series of... Ba -ba -ba -ba, Gokinjo Monogatari by Ayazawa uh, in the Perfect Editions. Volumes 1 to 4. Um, this is, uh, I guess, it, it's one of Ayazawa's most popular series here in Japan. It's got, like, a long anime, like, 50 episodes or something. Um, and it is also taking place in the same universe as Paradise Kiss. Uh, the main character here, Mikako, her little sister Miwako is one of the, uh, major supporting characters in Paradise Kiss. Um, and she really looks up to her older sister. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this follows a bunch of high school students at, like, a fashion-focused high school. Um, as the main character, Mikako, is trying to get her brand, Happy Berry, started. The others all have their various artistic pursuits going on, and there's just, like, this tangled mess of, like, relationships between all of them. They're all super fashionable and, like speak super hip Japanese, and yeah, look, look, isn't he just so fashionable you just want to punch him in the face? <laughs> uh, here's Mikako. I think Ayazawa's artwork from this era is, like, so cute. It is so cute. I feel like I'm reading some sort of, like, trendy magazine. Yeah, this is so cute. All the little, like, handwritten type. Yeah. Uh, it's a fun series. I haven't finished it. I've read the first two, so I need to get to the other two. I'm sure I'll probably cry at some point, but this is definitely a lot lighter in material than Ayazawa's later stuff that's for an older audience, like Nana in Paradise Kiss. So it it's mostly pretty pretty light, I would say. Next we have Koretto wa Shinokoto ni shita, or Colette Decides to Die by Alto Yukimura. This is a really, really cute series. I have volumes one to eighteen, which is caught up. Um this is oh goodness. That one's cute. Most recent cover. Uh, this is a story about a girl named Colette who works as the doctor, I guess, medicine person, <laughs> clinician in her little mountain village. Um, she's the only doctor they have, so she is immensely overworked all the time. And at the beginning of the series, she's going through a bit of a dark spell where she's like, I just don't have the energy to do this anymore. I just want to lay down and rest. I want to disappear down the well in my backyard and end up in some sort of other realm. And while she is musing about that, while staring into the well in her backyard, she falls in um, and wakes up in the underworld. Um where she is immediately sort of met with these little skeleton dudes. <laughs> They're really cute, um, and they all talk like grumpy old men. Um, but once they find out that she is a doctor, they're like, oh, you have to come with us. And they take her to their master, the Lord of the Underworld, Hades himself. <laughs> um, I wonder if I can find a cover with Hades on it. There we go. Volume 2's got him. There he is. Cutie. 
Um, he's sick and uh, we need you to help him. So she does, she helps him out um, and ends up, he ends up becoming like her away patient, uh, one of them. So she just comes down to the underworld every day after her other work is finished to look after him and help him get better. Uh, and after he does get better, they just, at that point, are friends. So she continues just, you know, spending her free time down in the underworld, getting to know Hades better, getting to know all of his little servants and friends in the underworld. Eventually, you know, we meet more of the Olympian gods and figures from Greek mythology um, who are all greatly cutesyified in this series. It, despite the slightly morbid title, this is very much like an Iyashike type of series along the lines of like, it feels very much to me like Snow White with the red hair. Um, obviously it's following in the sort of normal girl with supernatural creature trend of like ancient Magus Bride or something like that. Um, but Colette's personality is very similar to um, Shida Yuki from Snow White with the Red Hair, I would say. Uh, she's very likable. She's very into her job, very dedicated and diligent, and Hades is too. That's the main thing that I love about this series, is just the chemistry between Hades and Colette is so good. The way that, like, their attraction to each other starts off just as this mutual respect for another hardworking person who takes a lot of pride in their job. Um, and the way that, like, they're both, like, these workaholics who find solace in each other, who find a place to rest and maybe not work themselves so hard in each other, I think is so sweet. <laughs> Um, I really hope this one gets released in English someday, because it is so cute. It's so cute. And I love Hades. He is 157% my type. <laughs> um, yeah, that's Colette. Next we have Juichi Gatsunogi Munajiumu, or the November, November Gymnasium, by Moto Hagio. Uh, this one shot is sort of a prototype to the Heart of Thomas, um, and I don't have much to say about it beyond that. <laughs> it's mainly interesting, I think, because of its connection to the Heart of Thomas, the similarities and, like, seeing where she started with this idea of, like, a boarding school story and where it took her in the end. Um, next we have another favorite. So this is a really good shelf. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm moving my chair. This is Shonen Note, uh, Days of Evanescence by Yuki Kamatani. This is also the creator of Our Dreams at Dusk and Nabari no O. Um, yeah, this series is so good. It's about this boy, Yutaka, who um, is just entering middle school and he really wants to join the choir club so he does <laughs> he is dealing with a lot of like sensory issues he gets very overwhelmed when there's a lot of different sounds but he's also very sensitive to sound and can pick out the differences in sounds very well uh, <laughs> it's hard to explain but, um, he's, he's, he's kind of a whimsical little boy. <laughs> he feels very much like a Yuki Kamatani character, I feel like. Um, but it's hard for him because, like, he has trouble expressing his emotions. He has trouble, um, yeah, dealing with loud or new sounds. He's definitely... I would say, coded in a way that it would be easy to read him as being on the spectrum, um, although the story doesn't really define that at all. Um, but he joins this middle school choir club, and he has this incredible soprano. Um, and 
a big part of the series is him and this rival character that he has um, are both boys approaching puberty who are very define a lot of themselves with their their soprano voice um and so like dealing with the transience of youth and coming of age and puberty um in a lot of different ways because there are other members of the choir club who are you know also going through middle school and there's a lot of change that happens in that period um there are also a couple of non-binary characters in this cast, as you can expect from Yuki Kamatani, and their stories are also very interesting. It's just, ugh, ugh. It, this series, more than any other, like, makes me jealous of, like, the Japanese school club experience. It just makes me want to, like, experience it. It's the way that these kids just grow together and get to be such good friends. It's so heartwarming and wonderful and like there's parts of the series where I cried so much. Parts of the series where I was just filled with so much joy. This is another series that I really hope gets licensed in English. I also love how Yuki Kamatani portrays the music of both the choir club as well as some of the opera music that we see later in the series. I love how they portray it through their art. I feel like this is a series that they were just born to write. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Shown a note. It's really good. Next we have volumes one to three complete of Star Red by Morohagio. This is one of her sci-fi stories that I have not read yet, but I bought it because I loved the artwork for it that is in her SF Artworks book. But I have been lazy and haven't read it. Next we have Seigaku in Kouka Daigaku Yakambu. Ugh, ugh, I always get tripped up by that. Uh, this is a one-shot volume by Akiko Morishima about um, a bunch of students in the night classes of an engineering university that are kind of staying in, I think they're staying in a dorm together. Um, it's about this really girly woman here who is nervous to come into engineering school because she knows she's going to be surrounded by dudes, uh, which she is. Dudes and also this, you know, hot lesbian <laughs> because it's Akiko Morishima. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, that's, that's the setup. And then there's shenanigans ensue. Uh, this was a cute volume. I love Akiko Morishima. I like how she examines, like, the different, she, like, both of these girls, this one and, um, oops, her, grew up going to this, like, all-girls school, and they both experienced class S relationships, but the ways, the different meanings that those relationships hold for the two girls, with one of them being straight and one of them being gay, uh, is kind of interesting. There is also some good asexual representation in this volume. Um, it's just cute. It's cute. <laughs> Speaking of cute, we've got volumes 1 to 10 complete of Takane no Ransan by Anmitsu. This is being released in English digitally as Ron the Peerless Beauty. This is about this very, I guess, unapproachable beauty of her school, Ron, who, you know, she gets all the best grades, she's good at sports, but she's kind of unapproachable because, like, she's so perfect. Um, and she seems stuck up to a lot of people, but if you actually talk to her, of course, the secret is that she's just super shy. Um, but... 
the most popular boy in class. Very similar to, like, Kimi ni Todoke. Here he is. Saints Akira. Uh, ends up, I guess, helping her with her gardening club duties. And she realizes that they have the common point of really liking flowers. Uh, she learns that he works at his family's flower shop. And, you know, he really wants to be a florist when he grows up. And they sort of bond over that. And from there, we get just this really sweet <laughs> budding romance between them, I guess. I'm actually considering getting rid of this one because in the latter volumes, like right at the end, a lot of the last minute drama comes from like her dad being distressingly obsessed with her sex life and her you know taking that really seriously because it's her dad and I just hate that kind of plot line I hate men who are like that I, like and I know a lot of like dads get super defensive like you know why, why would you get mad at me for like wanting to protect my little girl but I'm like Protect her from what? <laughs> as long as she's being safe and knows what she's getting into, like, honestly, don't be weird. Don't be weird. Like, you are her father. Why are you so, like, distressed about the idea of her being deflowered? <laughs> Ugh. It's just so old-fashioned. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll get comments for saying that. <laughs> That's just my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was just kind of a sour note right there and like around here where I was just like, ugh, I really don't like how this series is like treating this plot line. So I don't know. Yeah. That, that one might be on its way out. It's so cute on my shelf, though. <laughs> these, these are the kinds of worries that I have in my life. But with that, that's the end of shelves five and six. Great note to start on, weird note to end on. But next we will be looking at the last of my standard-sized shelf, uh, shelves seven and eight. Uh, thank you for watching, and see you next time. Bye, guys.